Hello everyone, welcome to Northview's online service. Wherever you're joining us from, it's great to have you with us today. My name is Yvonne Funk and I'm the production coordinator here at Northview. Our Christmas season has officially started and we have a lot of exciting things lined up over the next month. Many of you have been asking, what are we doing here at Northview for our Christmas Eve services? Unfortunately, we have had to make the decision to cancel our on-site Christmas Eve services. However, we have already begun filming a very special online Christmas Eve service that we can't wait to share with you. It will be a time of celebration and joy even in the midst of these circumstances. And speaking of joy, we have wanted to give you another reason to smile and laugh this season. Northview's very own Leland Clausen will be hosting a comedy special from our stage. It will be a great night of comedy, special guests, music, and perhaps a few bloopers from our past several months of online services. Join us on December 18th online at 7 p.m. If you have kids, don't forget to check out our children's service. They've put together some really great Christmas themed songs and messages for your little ones. Now, we want to start our service a little differently today by hearing a short story from one of our young adults here at Northview. Following that, you'll hear a brief message about Advent from Pastor Greg. Twenty twenty was supposed to be the best year of my life. Instead, like most people in the world, I watched plans I had anticipated for years crumble away one by one. No high school graduation, no prom, no summer road trips with friends and family, no moving to California to start a whole new chapter at university. As the summer months progressed, I found myself angry, confused, and grappling for some sense of control and autonomy. Then the Lord reminded me of a prayer I had prayed in February, just weeks before everything changed. If I were to fully trust you, to fully realize that my sole purpose in life is to bring you glory, I wonder if I would be content no matter the circumstance in which you place me. Shouldn't I be? If my sole purpose is to glorify you and if I believe you are sovereign, I would simply have to rest, knowing that you are good and all of your plans are good, even when I don't think they are. I almost regretted those prayers of surrender that I had prayed, but those very prayers began to echo in my mind constantly. Slowly, my heart began to change. I started asking the Lord to make my heart ready and willing for what was to come. He has used this season to make me realize that I need His peace and that it can be found in simply surrendering my plans and preferences, and trusting the fact that He is good and that inherently His plans are good, and in looking forward to the hope that we have. As much as I mourn the missed memories of graduation, and as much as I would have loved to be in California right now, I can't help but feel peace and hope. We serve a Lord who aches with us in disappointment. He knew disappointment in ways far greater than we do. He sees us and He sympathizes with us. In the disappointment, we can be reminded that we follow a God who is faithful. We follow a covenant-keeping God who will not break His promises. The promise that one day He will come back for us. The promise that one day every tear will be wiped away. The promise that one day all will be right and all will be well. We don't have assurance that our plans will work out, but we do have assurance of who our God is, a covenant-making, promise-keeping God who sees His children and will be back for them soon. I believe that knowing this makes all of the uncertainty and disappointment perfectly worth it. We were in the first week of Advent. When I was growing up, Advent for me was the season where I was given a cardboard uh, chocolate calendar with little perforated boxes for the days of the month. And you would eat a little piece of terrible tasting chocolate every day until Christmas day arrived. Advent is the season that the church celebrates as we await for the day that Jesus came when, when he was born. It's my favorite Christmas song of the Advent season is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. That's, that's the whole heart of the Advent season is this expectant longing for the arrival of the Messiah, the Son of God, the Deliverer that Israel 
was expecting. See, Israel had waited hundreds of years for God to speak to them, to remind them that he was in their midst, that he was accomplishing his purposes for them. And they were living in the midst of great oppression from their Roman uh, overlords. And they were not able to be the people that God had called them to be. They didn't have a king on the throne and they were waiting expectantly longing for their plans to come to fruition, for this king to arrive. They were asking, come thou long expected king, which is what made it such great news when Gabriel came to Mary and said, there is a son who is going to come. You are going to bear the one who will sit on his father David's throne forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. There will be no end to his reign. And Mary pondered these truths that their plans for a king were finally coming to fruition. Advent is the season where the church enters into that story of expectantly longing for a king. The king came. Advent's the season where we spend week after week looking at the fact that this King Jesus actually did come and he can bring love, he can bring joy, he can bring peace. But the reality is that in this time that we're living in, we feel the but also not yet fully of those realities. We do experience love from Jesus truly and yet not fully. We do experience peace in Jesus truly and yet not fully. We experience joy in Jesus and yet not fully. So the season of Advent really is the season of recognizing that we've made plans for our lives and yet they've been changed. Advent is the season of us having expectations for what God will do in our midst and yet them not always coming to fruition. The season of Advent is the season of hope because we know that Jesus will come back again to finish what he has promised to do, to bring us home where we will be with him forever. It is a good season of hope because this long expected Jesus will come again. We wanna to sing together today. So let's join Andrew and the team as we worship our savior through song. Welcome here today, everyone. It's so good to have you worshiping with us. We want to start by reading from God's word. So Kendra's going to do that. Let's join in with her. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 to 6. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is right and just in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone are Savior. Show the world your love. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come your glory ring shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up who can stand against us you are strong to save in your mighty name king of heaven come we are children of your mercy Ask it for your glory And when we cry, Jesus Set our hearts towards you That every eye would see you Lifted up King of heaven, come down King of heaven, come down 
My 27th anniversary is coming up really soon here, December 17th, 1993. That's when I was married. Whenever our anniversary comes up, though, I, I recall all of the experiences that I had leading into uh, asking my, my wife to marry me. She always likes to tell me that uh, the thing that solidified her, her care and, and interest in me was, was not uh, when she first saw me, which of course shocked me, but it was, it was when uh, she was in our, the dining hall of our university, big, large cafeteria, and uh, she had gone through the, the line and had come out with a plate full of all sorts of food and drinks and things like that, and she, I don't know what happened, she pro I think she just tripped when she came out. She was out in the open and everybody was sitting there, and she tripped, and all of the food and everything just dumped on the floor. And of course, you know, you're dealing with college students. Everyone turns their head and they do the old, yay, start clapping. And my wife is a bit of an introvert. And so she was, she was horrified, thought it was terrible. I, and, and I was seated, I mean, a ways away from her. And nobody else was, got up to help her immediately. So I, I just sprung up and I went over to help her because I felt terrible. I, I knew her a little bit, um, but I went over and I crouched down and I started picking up, uh, you know, these things. And it, you know, sort of like one of those romantic comedies when they have that little meet cute. This was the moment, right? Our eyes met and she was convinced that I, I could be the guy for her. Um, I've asked her, so why, why not before that? Like, <laughs> Did, what, did, what did you know about me? And she said, well, you know, I, kn I knew you and I'd heard about you and things like that. But, uh, you know, she said that she had seen me in an elevator at one point and I didn't talk to her because I was just alone in my thoughts and stuff. And so she thought I was a bit aloof, which is a lot, a lot of people think when they, they meet me, uh, a little bit distant, uh, shy or just disinterested in others. But she said, when you, when you did that, it made me realize that actually he's not, you're not like that. You're, you're actually, um, kind, <laughs> which was a surprise to her. Um, that's the way it is when we, when we uh, le learn about another person's character. Um, we really only get to know them when we have experience with them, and our experience with them develops in our, in our minds uh, a knowledge of who, who they really are. So from a distance, we think they might be a particular way, but when you actually get to know them and you see the actions that they do and the way that they act towards you, you actually realize, oh, maybe my opinion about them prior was, was different. There are people today who uh, might think a particular thing about me, and then they meet someone who knows me well, and they're like, well, actually, Jeff's not like that. And you probably have friends like that as well. You probably are someone like that, that People might think something odd about you, and then when they meet you, it's, it, it's different. And then, you know, a year later, they say, you know, when I first met you, I thought you were very different than what you actually are like. And what they're describing there is just, is just what happens when uh, they experience your character expressed in a myriad of ways in their life. Um, so if you ask the question, what is God like? There are a lot of people who think they know God in particular ways because uh, they've kind of seen him at a distance and uh, think that, well, he's, he's mean and uh, vindictive and he gives people cancer and he does all these sorts of things and for some sort of higher purpose. I see that mocked in television all the time. And they see him at a distance and they think, oh, he's, he's this particular kind of kind of God, but then when, when they experience him and uh, he acts both in their lives and the lives of others, they realize that he might be a bit different than the way that they had perceived him to be. So all of us have a picture of God in our mind. The question ultimately is, is it the right picture? Is it the picture that actually uh, what, what, he's, what he's like? So when we come to the scriptures, one of the things that we're asking the characters in the Bible to tell us and uh, the writers of these, of these stories in the New Testament, the Gospels, for example, in the book of Luke, uh, we're asking them to tell us, what is, what is God like? In your experience with him, describe him as he really is. And this, this story that, that we're going to cover today is, uh, is a story where we learn from the experience of Zechariah what God is actually like. Like if we asked Zechariah his testimony about the Lord, what, what would he say? 
So there's a couple things, I think, uh, that, that he would say. Uh, one, that God is merciful, and, and second, that God keeps his promises. He's merciful and he keeps his promises. So those are kind of the, just the two big points that I, that I want to cover here in the next few minutes. So what we're looking at is Luke chapter 1, verse 57 to 66. Here's the first of those, the merciful God, as he's described in Luke chapter 1, verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. So this is the completion of the story of, of Zechariah. We had already covered a little bit of what happened to him before. He was going into the, the temple to serve his, as a priest. He gets, he gets in there. He's focused on, uh, you know, at the, incense, the altar of incense, and he's focused on his duty of cleaning it and reloading the incense. And an angel, his name's Gabriel, shows up right next to the altar and, and says, fear not. And he starts to tell him, look, you're going to have a baby boy, and he's going to be great before the Lord. You're going to call him John. And uh, now Zechariah being an old man and his wife being an old woman, he protests, basically, when the angel says this. He doesn't believe it initially. He instead says, look, you should have said that you should have come a long time ago because that's when my wife and I were you know, fertile. We were younger, but now we're not. So I don't understand why you're here. It, this can't be. The angel tells him that he shouldn't, basically, you shouldn't doubt him because he stands in the presence of God and he's been sent to, to give him this message. And so as a result of his unbelief, he's going to have to be quiet, mute, and we learn later that he's deaf for a good long time. And so where he left, we leave off Zechariah uh, as, a, as a deaf, mute guy who comes out of the temple and then starts to watch as God starts to fulfill his promise to his wife, Elizabeth, who ends up being pregnant in her old age. And she says later that God has removed my disgrace from, from me among the people. And then we pick it up here. So we left them off and then we started to visit with Mary. But now, now, now we're back. We're back with Zechariah. How does his story, at least in the book of Luke, finish? And you read it here. Elizabeth has a son, and her neighbors and relatives all come around in the same way that you would probably have your neighbors and relatives know all about your, your child being born to you. And uh, they, they reflect on this and say, well, the Lord has shown me great mercy in this. Like, that's the lesson that they've learned from all of this, that the Lord has shown them great mercy. And you got to imagine that that, that uh, mercy is, is remarkable. Because, you know, Elizabeth and, and Zechariah, they didn't have any child, and so that made them kind of lesser than in their community. But, but then they get a child, and it's not just any child, it, it's a boy. A boy can carry on the family name in the land. It means that they have a legacy. They can hand down their property and all their things to this, to this boy, and they can have basically like a social security plan because he's going to work in their old age. It's not that just that they had a child. A girl would be great, but they had a, had a boy. And so they've, they've basically struck it rich after being poor for all these years, after waiting for so long their entire lives and praying to God to get this child, and all of a sudden they, they get it in the most unexpected unexpected time. And you, can, you, you know that in situations in your life, when you have to wait for something and you thought you weren't going to be able to get it, and then when it comes, that waiting has built up such, a, such an amount of you know, pent-up joy that when it, it gets released, it's, it's bigger than just the normal kind of joy. So I, I remember um, the, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series a few years ago, and uh, they had not won it for a hundred and something years. hundred and something years. If you were a Cubs fan for that long, it used to be a joke about how, how horrible your team was and how they'll never win. But that, and then they won, and the, the parties that were had in Chicago like, were greater, honestly, than most of the World Series parties. The entire city of Chicago went into the streets and started partying because of it. Now, it, and it, it, it was pent up. It was a joy that was you know, just, just exploded because of how long they had waited. My wife and I, we, we actually were told that we could not have a third child. My little girl, Sophie, was t 
totally unexpected. Uh, we had gone to the doctor. They had said that there's no way you're going to have another child. It would be a miracle if you did. So we had come to the point where we were accepting that the Lord was going to have, we were going to have two boys, and that, that was going to be fine. It was the Lord's hand in our lives. We kept praying about it. Lord, maybe you could change. You changed Hannah. You gave Zechariah's wife Elizabeth a child. There's also, you know, Sarah in the Old Testament. You can give us a child. You're, you're capable of doing this. I remember I came home from work one day and my wife was standing at the top of the stairs and she gave me the little box and I opened the little box and inside was, uh, was one of those little uh, pregnancy sticks and on it was the little, little line. Now, I, I have not studied pregnancy sticks very much, so I didn't really know what that meant and I looked at her and I said, what? what? She said, we're pregnant and I, I just put the thing down and squeezed her and was like, ah! couldn't believe we couldn't believe it now we were excited when our we learned about our boys but there was something special about about Sophie I remember when I learned that it was going to be a girl I, I came home another day and my wife had, had given me a note and I opened the note and said uh, roses are red violets are pink and that's a color you need to get used to and we rejoiced over the fact that she was going to be a girl not only are we going to have a child it's going to be a spe you know it's going to be different than the ones we've had it's going to be a little girl and she's been such a delight to us right but you know what that's like, that pent up joy. And so here you have a, a story about a couple who've had this massive pent up joy and it, it explodes when they end up having the child and their reflection on it is that the Lord has shown us great mercy. Look, if you asked Zechariah to describe God and to say, what does your experience about God say about his character? one of the first things that the guy would say is that he's merciful. That's what God's like, full of mercy. And in saying that, he would be echoing a lot of the things that the Bible itself says about God when God introduces himself to people. So there's a story I brought up a number of weeks ago. It was, um, it was uh, when Moses meets God for the first time, you know, you're going to go and you're going to free the people of Israel. He goes off and he frees the people of Israel, they go across the Red Sea the ten, after the ten plagues. They get on the other side. They start to worship the Lord. Eventually, they go to uh, Mount Sinai where God gives them the law. When the Lord gives them the law, Moses is up on the mountain and the people are down below. And, the, you know, the second in command guy, Aaron, is down there and the people are getting restless because they're thinking Moses has departed and we don't know where he's gone. Maybe he and God just kind of took off. He's not coming back. So if he and God, he and Yahweh are gone, then we need to have a God who's going to care for us. So they said, we can make one for ourselves. They got all sorts of gold and they molded into the shape of a golden calf. And Aaron being, you know, a foolish pastor as he was, he, en he enabled them and helped them to, you know, to make this calf. And then once the calf was there, they started to celebrate the calf, dancing around it and, uh, engaging in what the Bible calls revelry. So think about the, the most, you know, degraded parties that you could possibly think. That's what they're doing out down there in the valley. And Moses finally comes down. He's got the Ten Commandments. He sees what's going on and he bashes the Ten Commandments along, along the rocks. And the Lord says, just get out of the way, Moses. I'm going to blow them away, all of them. And Moses stands in the, in the gap for the people and says, whoa, 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 Lord, 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 just wait, 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 wait. And he pleads with him to show mercy. And the Lord, of course, he does. He shows, he shows mercy. And a while later, Moses is still kind of unsure about what the Lord's going to break out in anger to the people of Israel. And so he needs a guarantee that God's not going to do that. So he, he says, Lord, can I, can I be up close to you? Can I see you really close? And the Lord said, listen, you can't see my face because if I see my face, you're going to die. But you're going to, I can pass by you, put him in the cleft of a rock. And he passed by, the, the Lord passed by. And when he passed by, in Exodus 34, verse 5, here's what the Lord said. And Moses is right up close to him. He's seen him at a distance. He's even, you know, he's experienced God to some degree, but now he's got, this is as close as he's ever gotten to God. And God says this about his character. You want to know what I'm like? Says God to Moses as he passes by. Exodus 34, verse 5. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. 
What am I like? Merciful. It's fundamental to who I am. I am a God who shows mercy, which is a very different picture than most of us have of God if we stand at a distance. A lot of us view God as this, um, well, he's like a boss who nitpicks every time you do something wrong in the factory or every time you get a, you know, a paper wrong. I've worked at a, at a car rental agency and the guy who was, who was my boss would, would show up and he would, every time he showed up, he just would grab the papers that I'd filled out and he'd circle different errors I had made in, in the location of the, the thing that needed to be filled out. There were so many papers and so many little things that you had to remember about each paper that I was inevitably going to get something wrong. He never talked about how well I'd done. He'd just come in and he'd nitpick. And every time he showed up, I was like, you'd just do, oh, because you knew you were just going to get it. He's like that. He's like the coach. Some people think, well, he's like the, that coach who can never be pleased enough by the, by the performance of the players. That when they come back into the dugout or back to the bench, he just gripes at them about what they've done wrong. The next practice, he yells at them and tells them all the things that they've done wrong. He thinks that's coaching. And that's the way we picture God sometimes. He's, he's a nitpicking tyrant. He just wants to, he actually wants to punish us, put us on the bench, leave us out of the game because you just get sick and tired of dealing with us. And yet the Bible's a very, very different picture. In fact, in the New Testament, God is described by Luke later on, Luke 15. He's described as, as, as a father who has a son who snubs his nose at the father and says, I want all of my inheritance now. He takes off and he goes and parties, basically treats the father like he wish he were dead. He goes out and parties. He realizes at some point after he, all the money's run out and he's sitting there eating the food that pigs are eating, he, uh, he realizes that my, my, the slaves at my dad's house, the servants, they get, they get eat more than this. They eat better than this. So I'm just going to go back. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son, but I'm just going to go back and I'm going to plead with him to show me mercy. And you know the story, most of us, that the son starts making his trek back. And, and while he was a long way off, says the scriptures, the father, in the, a culture where honor is the most important thing, you do not degrade yourself. You do not act like a fool. You do not show massive emotion to someone who is beneath you in the, in, in, in the uh, status chart. This father, rich, important man, runs to his son. Takes off, picks up his robe and starts running like a little girl to his son. He's so excited to see him. Of course, the son says when he gets there, Father, I've, I've sinned against you and against God and I, I, I'm not wor no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father kind of cuts him off and says, nah, stop it, stop it. My son is home. He was dead and now he's alive. Kill the fat and calf. We're going to have a party. That's what God's like. He's, he scans the horizon waiting for the lost ones to turn around a little bit so that he can run to them. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's merciful. That's what you learn about God when you get right up close to him. There is a little story in, uh, in a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. It's an old book from the, I think it's 1990s or so. Uh, the author's name is Philip Yancey, and he, he tells this story about a friend of his and his difficulty with his daughter. So here's, here's how Yancey tells this story. I've shared this before. I, I, it's so lovely. It's worth hearing over and over again. He said, not long ago, I heard from a pastor friend who was battling with his 15-year-old daughter he knew she was using birth control and several nights she had not bothered to come home at all. The parents had tried various forms of punishment to no avail. The daughter lied to them, deceived them, found a way to turn the tables on them. It's your fault, she said, for being so strict. My friend told me, I remember standing before the plate glass window in my living room, staring out into the darkness, waiting for her to come home. And I felt such rage. I wanted to be like the father of the prodigal son. Yet I was furious 
with my daughter for the way she would manipulate us and twist the knife to hurt us. And yet, I must tell you, when my daughter came home that night, or rather the next morning, I wanted nothing in the world so much as to take her in my arms, to love her, and to tell her I, I wanted the best for her. I was a helpless, lovesick father. That's a good picture of God. The father of the prodigal, the one who shows mercy to the people in the valley who deserve judgment, who've constructed an idol and are dancing around it in the face of God. So the question that you need to ask yourself is, in what circumstance do I need to know the mercy of God? If that's what he's really like, then how do I need to change my thinking about him so that I approach him as the God of mercy? I mean, do you have a past perhaps that you look back on and you regret, you regret, you regret? You, you think to yourself, there's no way that God could possibly use me or want me because of all the things that I have done. There's wickedness in me that I can't even explain. You remember, of course, that if you turn, if you're willing to turn and come to your senses as that little the boy did when he's eating the pig slop, if you're willing to come to your senses and just make a move toward God, he's ready to run to you. Or maybe you're somebody who's like, man, that's not my past, making all, the, the wickedness is not my past, it's, the, it's in the present. I, I, I struggle a lot and have struggled a lot with being near to God. I've done, I've done some very disobedient and wicked things, and I think I can't run to God. I've got to clean myself up first. I've got to make myself right. No, 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 no. No. He's merciful. That's who He is. He wants to show compassion. He's inclined toward it. So just to make a move, just make a little turn, and you will find the Lord will run to you. Some of us just feel flat overwhelmed by life and uh, COVID and the circumstances that we're in. And every morning we wake up and there's this foreboding presence on top of us. Like we can't, I'm not sure I can possibly make, make it through the day. I'm going to massive difficulty today and I don't know if I'm going to make it. Mental health is going crazy. You feel like you've got to take care of it yourself, but you do realize that God is a God of mercy that you can cry out to him in those deep moments and say, Lord, have mercy on me. This, I don't, can't do all this stuff. Show your mercy to me. That's who you are, Lord, compassionate and gracious and kind. And he will run to you because that's what he does. So what would Zechariah learn about God? And what would he tell you about him, his character? He'd say, well, I, I see him as God of mercy. Secondly, he would say that he is a promise-keeping God. So, uh, verse 59, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he's, he's to be called John. And they said to her, look, there's no one among your relatives that has that name. Now, um, one Jewish tradition was to, to name your child at, at the circumcision. Circumcision, the, the, the circumcision, I know it sounds crazy, but it was a party, right? The Jewish people at Brists, they still do this uh, today. But it was, it was a party. You would invite your friends over because it was the time that your child, your son, was going to acknowledge that he was part of the covenant community of God. And he was going to get circumcised. That was going to be the sign that he was going to be part of the covenant community of God going forward. He's one of God's people is the way they would understand that. And so you invite all your friends over and they're going to have a party. And, and it, in, in some Jewish circles, that was the day that you named the child. The expectation, of course, is that you'd name your child after the father or grandfather because it showed honor to the father or grandfather. Listen, in those days, they did not sit down with baby books and start in the letter A and say, do you want to name him Aaron or Aardvark or Altitude? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't go through that. They weren't looking for the most weird uh, spelling uh, of Megan, you know, M-Y-G-O-N. They, they, they wouldn't do that. 
Instead, they would say, look, what's the child's name? We well, get two options. He's either going to be the father or grandfather. If it's a boy, father or grandfather. So the expectation they have is that she's going to say, what do you want the child to be? Which one? Father, grandfather. And she's expecting her to say, Zechariah. But she doesn't. She says, John, which is nowhere near the name of their family. So, I mean, this would very much be like... Um, my friend, uh, when I was in college, was named uh, Telvid Devlet. He's a great guy. It was just weird that his first name was his last name spelled backward. Telvid Devlet. He used to giggle about it and think, was there nobody around when my parents named me who would have just objected at a point and said, what are you doing? That, that would be like my parents sitting there, so what should we name uh, Jeff? Oh, we'll do, his, we'll do his last name backwards, Man Cub Bucknum. And I would expect somebody at that moment to p push back and say, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, really? Man Cub? That's not going to go well for him when he's 15. So this is what's happening in this, in this passage is you've got Elizabeth saying, well, we're we going to name him John. And everyone's responding like they just said Man Cub. So they freak out a little bit and they, they think, well, why don't you just stay here for a minute, uh, Elizabeth, and we're going we're gonna to talk to your husband about this for a minute because by naming him John and not Zechariah, you're denigrating your husband and I know he's been deaf and mute for a while. We've got to communicate with him to stop you from this stupid mistake. So they made signs, verse 62, who is father, to find out what he would like to name the child. Of course, they're expecting Zechariah. He asked for a writing tablet. These writing tablets had... Uh, it had a, a, a piece of w some wax on top of a, a board, and you'd just take a sharp implement like a stick, and you could write. That was the way that they did, did it in that day. So he takes this little board, the sharp implement, and he starts to write. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. And immediately, his mouth was opened, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with, with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these, all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, okay, given the circumstances of this kid's birth, you know, deafness and muteness of the father that came true when he came free of it when he, when he named him John, what then is this child going to be? Because God's on the move. The Lord's hand was with him. Um. You have to imagine Zechariah's last 10 months of life. Uh, I enjoy talking. Uh, I have the gift of fleetness of tongue. If you're talking to people, being around people, I enjoy listening to them I, and, and engaging with them. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be deaf and mute for a period of time. I would think it would be very lonely. You'd be all alone with your thoughts. Can you imagine what Zechariah's thinking for those 10 months of his life? He's probably thinking, man, why did I question the angel? I mean, his wife probably loves it. It's the first time she's, she's felt understood. But I should have listened to the angel. I should have believed. Man, I was a fool. And now I'm stuck in this situation, just sitting here thinking, ruminating about what I did and how dumb it was. This is like the longest quiet time ever thinking about his unbelief. And then he's, he's watching as God word, God's word is coming true right before his eyes, but he's not able to express anything about it. He's changed his mind. So when he's finally asked whether he wants to name the child John in agreement with the angel and after all he's seen, how his, the word of the angel has been fulfilled, he jumps at the chance. In fact, uh, in the Greek of this passage, it, the word John is in what we call an emphatic position. It's, it's like he's asked, what do you want the name to be? John! His name is John! He's adamant that the name be John. And his mo the moment he says that, his, his mouth is freed up. He's basically been sent into this, uh, into this difficult uh, prison of his mind. And then the moment that he gets the chance, he expresses his belief and he's, He's finally freed, and he praises God, and he reflects. At that moment, if you'd come to, to Zechariah, you say, well, what's God like? 
I'm telling you, he'd tell you he would tell you um, he keeps his promises. You know, there's another story in the Bible that sounds very similar to this. Uh, it's, it's a story about a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. He was a king, and he thought pretty highly of himself. He went out on the edge of his kingdom, looking down at it from his castle, I guess, and he, was, he just said, I am the greatest king that there is. There's nobody bigger than me and badder than me, and I can do what I want. And the moment he said that, apparently the Lord told him, well, okay, because you're so arrogant, you're going you're gonna to sit out in the sit out of the game for a little while. So he made him go nuts, the Lord did. He actually ended up eating grass like a cow and wandering around a field like a cow while his fingernails grew way out and his hair grew long. So, you know, like Gollum. Dude, he's the fat one knows. You know, he's, he's all over the field like that, eating the grass and fingernails. He needs to have a clipping of the fingernails. And finally, um, he comes back to his senses and he, and he says in Daniel 4, after being put out to pasture, literally, and being brought, coming back in his right mind, he says in Daniel 4, verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. And then I praised the Most High, just like Zechariah. I praised the Most High. And here's what I said about the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth, even the great king like I am, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand and say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar, what did you learn in your quiet time? He is sovereign. Nobody stands in his way. I was wrong. He's great. I'm not. Zechariah, what have you learned in your long, quiet time? He keeps his promises. What he says, he does. It might not look like it in the moment. It might seem crazy for an old couple to have a child like this. But he always fulfills his word. Don't doubt the word of God. That's, I mean, I think if you were Zechariah, were sitting here right now, and he were preaching a sermon to you, he'd say, look, listen, the merciful God will bring to fruition all that he says. Don't doubt the word of God. It always comes true, even when it looks like it can't. Don't let, don't let dire circumstances cloud your belief that God will come through like he promised. My father-in-law, uh, pastor for a number of years, he used, he used to have this saying, it, delightful. My wife repeats it to me frequently when I get down. Uh, the saying he had was, uh, remember in the dark what you know to be true in the light. Remember in the dark what you know to be true in, in the light. I think about that from time to time, that saying, uh, every time I go to the Downstairs of our house, my wife says, oh, can you go get something from the office, which is downstairs and through our suite until the other end. And often I go down there and it's pitch black. Uh, and I have to mentally recall where all the furniture is so that I don't hit it. I know I'm lazy. I should probably turn the light on, but it's like an extra four steps the opposite direction. You have to reach over a counter and I'm, that can't be bothered. So I go by memory. My toes would wish that I would go and turn the light on, but... <laughs> I go by memory. I, I, I try to remember in the dark what I know to be true in the light so that I don't stub my toe, so that I don't, I don't get hurt. Because in the dark, you just, you can't obviously see straight. You, you can't think right. And, and this is the case in our lives. We, we must remember when it doesn't look like it, who God is and what he says. When the questions come into our mind about whether or not he's right or whether or not he's actually going to be able to bring to fruition the things that he said, we need to remember in that dark, cloudy moment, we need to remember what's true in the light because that's the real God. And the circumstances of our life are often dark and stormy. But you've got to remember who he is. In the New Testament, listen, let me just finish with this. In the New Testament, there is a uh, great story. It's in the book of Luke. 
again, you have this, this lovely story about Jesus who tells the disciples, hey guys, we want, I want to go out to the other side of the lake. We're going to get in this boat, a bunch of fishermen, right? They're used to the lake that they're on, and spent their lives on it fishing. We're going to go to the other side of the lake, okay? Well, they get out to the middle of the lake. Jesus is in the boat. He's, he's actually asleep on a cushion in the back. And they get out to the middle of the lake and a grand storm comes up. So grand, in fact, that these fishermen, lifelong Sea of Galilee uh, livers, fishers, uh, they're so freaked out, they think they're going to die. And so they grab Jesus, shake him, and they're like, dude, you got to wake up. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Luke 8, 22, let's go to the other side of the lake. And they got in the boat and set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And he got up. He rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. And he said, where's your faith? In fear and amazement, they ask one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. What was their problem? Well, they didn't have faith. Jesus pointed it out. Where's your faith? What faith in what? Faith that they had God in the boat. It's different. If you just have normal people in the boat who don't have authority over the winds and the waves, yeah, I freak out. But if you've got God, who made the sea in the boat. It doesn't matter how big the clouds are. It doesn't matter how raging the storm is. It doesn't matter how hard the wind blows. You have God in the boat. Look, is there any doubt that God will build his church and the gates of hell will, won't prevail against it? Was there any doubt that Jesus was going to be able to get those guys to the other side of the lake? Yeah, but there were a bunch of storms there. So? How can God build his church in the middle of this COVID? We're getting shut down and everything's going wrong. Is there any doubt that even in the midst of this storm that God is going to keep his word? It might be in unexpected ways. But is there any doubt that he will? Is is there any doubt that God will use all things for our good if you love him and are called according to his purpose? Is, is, Is there any doubt that that will happen? Yeah, but I face evil and sorrow every day and I my life doesn't make sense and I'm overwhelmed. Yeah, but I know you're in the dark. I get it. The waves are high. And you're freaking out in the boat. It looks like God's asleep in the boat, but he's God. And he's in the boat. Is there any doubt that he's able to bring about what he promises? That he's able to use the evil and sorrow and all those things to accomplish for you exactly what he promised? To work it for good. Is there any doubt that God will bring his children safely through the storms to their eternal home? Yeah, but I wander so much. Honestly, I take my eyes off him all the time, and the waves are crashing, and they're huge, and I worry. Is there any doubt that he's able to do what he said? Remember in the dark what you know to be true in the light. The merciful God keeps his promises. Just to ask Zachariah. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. One way that we as a church family respond to who God is and what He has done for us is to give a portion of our money back to Him in worship. Everything that we have is from God, and so we want to give generously and thankfully. If you're new here, please do not feel obligated. But for those of you who call Northview their home church, there are several ways you can give. You can text GIVE to the number on the screen. You can go to northview.org and find the button that says give. You can also mail in a check to our offices at the Downs Road campus or drop it off in person during office hours. 
Last week, in Pastor Mark's sermon, he touched on two multiplication initiatives that Northview is participating in. First is a partnership with Westside to plant a church in Kelowna. If you'd like to hear more about the vision of this church plant, we encourage you to visit praxischurch.ca. We'll be hosting an info night to share more about this in early 2021. The second is a special offering to raise money to assist Midtown Church in Vancouver with a building renovation. The building was formerly known as Culloden MB Church and needs significant updates. You can give to this fund online until December 13th at northview.org give or text Midtown Project to the number on the screen. Now, let's join Andrew and the team for one more song. for being with us today. We would love to leave you with this blessing from God's Word found in Revelation 1, 5-6. to 
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.